got uh, David Costello. He's been our chief mechanic on the uh, assembly and uh, checking out on this airplane. Uh, did the weight and balance on it yesterday. Did the final inspection uh, in the wee hours of the morning today. Uh, Rob Runyon is our uh, test pilot. We just finished the first flight. He put 0.6 on the airplane. What, four takeoffs and uh, landings? Yep. Four takeoffs and landings, uh, full stop, uh, one go around. Uh, do you have any squawks? Nope. Airplane flew good right out of the box first time. Thank you, David. Uh, good job. And uh, we've had a lot of fun working on uh, these airplanes. This is the very first airplane to fly with the Lycoming 233 light sport engine. And we're working with Lycoming and Champion Electronics to develop this engine and this electronic ignition system for the airplane. Uh, we'll be uh, flying this airplane in subsequent days, weeks, months, and whatever, reporting back to both Lycoming as well as Champion Electronics. Uh, first flight was very successful. Everybody here has big smiles on their faces. Uh, any unusual characteristics or any fun things you found about this airplane compared to the other one? Um. Not so much compared to the other one, but uh, by myself today in the airplane, it was fun that uh, we could be in excess of 1,000 AGL by the end of the 4,000 foot runway. So we saw, I saw uh, accelerating through 80 knots in 1,500 feet a minute. So that was kind of fun. Nothing yeah. wrong with that. Yeah. Uh, I almost got on the Unicom and asked you to air taxi back to the ramp. Right, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, it, uh, it performed quite well today. I suspect that even on a hot summer day, it's going to perform quite well. Uh, how long did it take you in seconds, and how many feet do you think to get airborne? Oh, I would guess uh, 500 feet, between 500 and 600. And on the timing, just about the time the throttle's all the way in, it's ready to rotate and go. So probably... Certainly under 10 seconds, maybe okay. six, seven seconds. Okay. Uh, in cruise, I know you didn't have much time for that, right. but uh, in the pattern altitude, mm -hmm. uh, what what RPM and what velocity? Uh, we saw about 2,400 RPM. I think it's a uh, doesn't wind up quite like the 235 one. It might be a propeller difference, but uh, it'll go right up past 110 knots and keep accelerating. I think it'd go right to the 120 knot limit for sure. So in the traffic pattern, as soon as you level off in contrast to the traditional Cessnas and things, you have to get right out of the power, almost more like uh, a high performance, like a jet airplane would be. You level off and get right out of the power, else the speed's gonna wind right up on you. So to keep it anywhere near flap range, you have to come right on back to about 2,000 RPM right away, because it'll go right up to 120. Okay, what was your ground speed when you were going downwind? <laughs> I don't know, I didn't, the GPS was dimmed, I couldn't see it. So. I see. <laughs> okay. Pretty good uh, probably with the 25-30 knot wind. Yeah, you, were, yeah. you were doing you were really really good going <laughs> downwind. Oh, yeah. it, was, it was looking good. I, and uh, what, what speed did you touch down and what flap setting? Uh, most of them I was using 40 flaps because I was purposely staying high. And so, and then Doc had mentioned not so much on idle power. So I tried to leave a little power in, in the flaps. And so about 70 knots down final because it's gusty. If it was calm, I'd probably use 60 knots. And at touchdown, I'm guessing it's probably in the 55 knot range. I wasn't really What would you really guess your ground speed it. was? <laughs> oh, probably walking <laughs> speed, yeah. It seemed yeah. like touchdown and turn off right away. Yeah. David, uh, yesterday we uh, completed the weight and balance on the airplane. And how does this airplane compare to the other airplane weight and then balance-wise? It's a little um, lighter in the nose. Um, I think the CG is at least an inch. Okay. Around, roundabouts that. Okay. Um, and about the same weight in the gears. Okay. And has this airplane got a uh, difference in the landing gear from the other airplane? I heard him talking about the difference in the ability for it to taxi a little bit easier and turn and um, things like that. This gear is, um, I believe, I don't remember exactly what it was. I didn't install it. But mm -hmm. um, they're uh, designed that, uh, with these um, particular wheels and stuff. And it has some adapters where it uh, doesn't tow in or tow out. It's just right. Okay, so that's noticeable. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm sure that is noticeable on the handling, especially on the takeoff rolls, mm -hmm. isn't it? Yeah, it went straight. It goes straight, and it rolls out straight after landing. So. Okay. okay. Well, this airplane is uh, marketed. It's been developed uh, uh, in this country, at least, uh, North American distributorship by Renegade Aircraft here in Lee Summit, Missouri. Uh, Christopher Doc Bailey is the uh, man in charge of this company. So uh, all of us have been putting lots of time in. There's lots of smiles on everybody's face today. Uh, the first flight was uh, very uneventful. We always like that. And in fact, uh, talking to the pilot, it was probably a fun first flight. It was. So uh, we're, we're all smiling today, and we've enjoyed uh, putting the planes together and seeing them fly. And uh, this is especially meaningful to all of us.
The first flight today didn't look as uh, pretty as you'd like. That's because we had some uh, pretty gusty wind conditions. What were the wind conditions today? Uh, zero to zero at uh, 15, gusting to 23 at takeoff. I think it feels stronger now. It's probably gusting to 25. We're using I think they were higher than that by the time you were ready. Yeah, I, I yeah. think there was probably stronger gusts than that. So uh, I, it looked like Rob had his hands full. Uh, on the climb out, the airplane was bucking around quite a bit, and there were several other uh, home-built airplanes to walk out. The wings for you guys. There you go. Yeah, <laughs> uh, but everybody was uh, really having a good ride out there today. It wasn't uh, it wasn't an elevator ride by any means. Uh, they were they were jumping around because of the the winds out there. So uh, that was a little bit of a challenge, and it met that very well. Again, my name is Fred Schieser, and. Uh, I taught aerodynamics for uh, about 35 years, and I used to uh, ask my students on their final exam the same question. Everybody could answer that question that ever graduated from uh, my program. And that question is, what is it that really makes an airplane fly? And the answer is? Money. Money. <laughs> this is Frosty Hafer and Chris Bailey, and they're the ones responsible for making this airplane fly today. Uh, they have provided the money, and they've provided a lot of time and a little bit of risk. Uh, and uh, we've all been crossing our fingers and hoping that this venture would turn out as well as it has so far and even better in the future. And uh, Frosty and Chris are the ones behind Renegade uh, Aviation here and a uh, light sport aircraft, and we're hoping that the light sport aircraft uh, continues in popularity here in this country. Uh, Mr. Bailey, how long has this airplane been uh, in this country and under your umbrella? Well, we've been uh, basically trying to bring the aircraft to Lee Summit, Missouri for almost three years now. So the aircraft was initially introduced in uh, 2007. It was the Light Sport Registry number 82 through TNT Aviation in 2008. Uh, we were their exclusive distributorship and recently was able to buy the entire uh, uh, distributorship and all their inventory and bring it to Lee Summit just in July. Okay. And uh, how many of these light sport aircraft have flown previously with this Lycoming Light Sport 233? This is it. This is the first one. Uh, Rob, uh, everybody here has, has gone through a, a painstaking ordeal of, of uh, putting this thing together. We, we hauled it back from Oshkosh 2010, and basically every day from then till now, uh, Frank, uh, Dave Costello, Mark Burroughs, Fred Cheeser, Rob Runyon, everybody, it has been a team uh, to put this together, and, and literally they've all pitched together and, and made, this, uh, they made this happen. So it wasn't me, Frosty, and all this other stuff. It was, a, it was a group of probably up to 10 people that made this thing fly. Yeah. Frosty, you've been flying around the Midwest uh, as long as I can remember. Uh, have you ever seen an airplane that looks as good and flies as good as these uh, Falcons do? It's an outstanding example example of design and manufacturing to me it's somewhat new to me i flew the old metal plane so this is totally new and wonderful I, I taught aircraft design for a lot of years and all the things that i taught that ought to be in an airplane are incorporated in this airplane and uh, 15 or 20 years ago my comment was, why don't we use glass cockpits and everything? And I'm willing to bet that very few light sport aircraft have a complete glass cockpit. Can you tell us a little bit about the capabilities of the glass cockpit on this airplane? Sure. Uh, we've got with Grand Rapids Technology uh, a vendor that's really on the cutting edge, along with Garmin and Dynon. Uh, Grand Rapids came to us and said, hey, we had a great uh, panel they wanted to do. They wanted to know if we would put it in the aircraft. And after a lot of extensive research, Carlos Fernandez up there uh, sent us a couple models to put in. And they're synthetic vision, built-in GPS, built-in auto paddle. Uh, and these aircraft, and being a 100 and, I mean, 88.5 inch display, makes it all very clean, very efficient, synthetic vision. It's the state of the art in any aircraft now. I mean, it rivals the, uh, the big birds on as far as uh, viewing and synthetic vision. But uh, it is the first and foremost of any of the avionics panels are right into the, uh, into the Falcon now. So that's our standard equipment that we're going to put on. That's standard equipment. That's standard equipment. What do you got for backup? Well, we're pretty fortunate that I'm old and crusty and had a great teacher in the old days. So uh, basically we went ahead and put some steam gauge backups on there, uh, enough to, if for whatever the occasion, would have a total failure of any of the electronics that uh, it's got airspeed, VSI, altimeter, and uh, artificial horizon with a mag compass 
And so you have a full cluster to get you home. So you can still fly to a needle ball and alcohol when that, everything that else fails. Needle ball, alcohol, stick pedal rudder. That's it. You betcha. That's it. You betcha. And this aircraft does have stick pedal. It does system. have a stick. It's got That's a fighter go. stick seven, push pull t control tubes, no cables. And electric trim. And electric trim on a stick. You never have yeah. to take your hand off there the aircraft to trim it. Okay. So well, it's it looks a, like an outstanding aircraft. We wish you well in the future. We appreciate it. Thank you very much. You bet. Mr. Bailey, what yeah. can you tell us about the differences between the Lycoming 235 and the Lycoming 233 light sport? Well, I tell you, we, we're able to put both of them in because of the lightness of the aircraft. The whole aircraft itself, even with the uh, uh, 235 engine, doesn't weigh close to 800 pounds. So by having a 233 engine, uh, they've knocked out almost 40 pounds off the engine. It is now CDI. It is now dual CDI, a redundant system that basically uh, has electronic ignition. Uh, the fuel injected package will be out in November. Um, we now have the uh, carburetor version here to test, but they've cut a lot of the weight, a couple pounds out of the crank, a couple pounds off the flywheel, 40 pounds in any kind of engine to hold the same lightweight, 116 horsepower. Uh, basically, we just have the same aircraft engine with all the latest and greatest uh, updates that's 38 pounds lighter and uh, the same 116 horsepower. So the engine itself, whenever you're talking about light sport, we're always worried about weight. 1,320 is the max you can take off. And any time you can cut the weight down to get more of a useful load in light sport, that's what our clients are looking for. They're looking for useful load. They're looking for performance. And the best thing that I can tell you about the engine, it's like homing. It's not a Rotax. It's not a Jabiru. It's not a Volkswagen conversion. In the light sport industry, this is the first aircraft engine that really legitimizes the, the category simply because, hey, every person, every pilot for the last 40 years has been flying to Lycoming in their Cessna 152, 150, and now it brings that comfort level to the, the client who walks up and says, oh, it has a real aircraft engine rather than a snowmobile conversion or a Jabiru engine. The Jabiru is, an, is another great engine, but our first choice and many of our clients' first choice is the Lycoming by far. The Lycoming engine putting in this airframe with those avionics puts together a package that's really going to be hard to beat today's U.S. market. At max, con max continuous power cruise, what kind of uh, fuel consumption do you expect on this engine? Uh, the book says 5.2 on the fuel consumption on that, and that's at 2,400 RPM. And the, the nice thing is, uh, uh, once again, the engine has a low RPM at 2,400 for cruise. Mm -hmm. It also is direct drive. You don't have to have the gear reduction system on it to do the Rotax. And, the, and another thing is a 2400 TBO. So the people have high hour output. It has a great reliability and uh, manufacturer's name in Lycoming. And, and we believe it's going to be real hard for the competitors to, to beat anything with a Lycoming engine. It, unfortunately, we're the first ones, as you can tell. The, we volunteered and worked with Lycoming to do this so our guys would know knowing what the market's going to bring, how to put it in, what the quirks would be for the installation. And, you know, they've overcome a lot of issues. And uh, basically right now we're ready to start putting the aircraft in with the 233 engine right away. So Lycoming's really been gracious with this. Uh, we've, in return, able to put it in this great uh, aircraft. And, and they were nice enough to let us have the aircraft on display at their Lycoming tent at Oshkosh, which to me speaks volumes about their... Uh, trust in us and the aircraft itself. So I I'm think like, if I was like homing, I'd want to have it in an airplane like this too. Yeah. So, so if you think about it, the airplane's going 120 knots at uh, 2,400 RPM extended max continuous power, and uh, I don't think you can do that with your Buick at under five gallons an hour. No. So no. this is this is much more efficient than most of the cars on the road today, and uh, a whole lot more fun. Gentlemen, i got to say it's a pleasure to stand here with all of you and uh, all the others that have helped put this plane together and make it a reality. Uh, we're going to build these in Lee Summit, and that's kind of something that a lot of people have had a dream about as well. And uh, we've had a great first day. Congratulations to everybody.